morning. I'm Karen Gallagher, and I'm part of the FBC community here. And if you follow rugby, I'm not going to apologize for my Scottish accent this morning. Here's something we've all wondered about. It's a human question, a universal question. We've all asked ourselves, why doesn't God do something about evil? And maybe that's still a big challenge to your faith. You're working on it. Or you're still questioning God's existence because of this broken world. Why doesn't God do something? Every time we see the news, there's war, stabbings, conflict. We ask this question. Every time there's a diagnosis, an accident, a loved one dies too young, and God doesn't answer our prayer. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? If he's powerful enough to stamp out evil, why doesn't he do it? I've cried out to God about the international situation. Do something, God, about terrorism. I sat at the hospital bed and stood at the graveside and cried, do something, God, about cancer. I wonder what you would do about evil in the world if you were a good, powerful God. Would you eliminate it? Would you stamp it out? But we've got to tread a bit carefully here, though. Eliminating all the bad stuff? Where exactly would you draw that line? We gloss over our own bad stuff. We don't count the mess in our own heart, in our life. We think that stuff like white lies and impatience, self-centeredness and broken promises don't really count as evil. Have you ever done something bad? Maybe the only reason you don't do something worse is something evil, is that you know you'd get caught. I know that's sometimes true for me. So now we have to ask the question, how could a good God allow me to keep on living? Because I'm part of the bad, the evil in this world. If God was good and eliminated all evil, he'd have done something about me by now. So how can we discover what God is doing about this? We're going to look at an eyewitness account of one unforgettable event in the life of Jesus, the man who claimed to be God's son, who claimed to know what God is doing in our broken, even evil world. This unique event happened not long before Jesus headed to Jerusalem for what he knows will be the last time. And it's part of our countdown series, looking at events and people Jesus encountered in his last days on earth. The cross is before him, not for him an unexpected tragedy, but a vital moment in Jesus' wider mission. His death is part of the plan to deal with evil and establish the kingdom of God. The world's greatest miscarriage of justice will pave the way for Jesus' resurrection. Unbelievable, except there would be so many eyewitnesses. If you want to follow along or catch up with more of the events that surround this crucial moment in history, just go to fbcnext.com. John is our first century eyewitness this morning. He spent lots of time with Jesus, recorded what he said and the way he lived. And John wrote that Jesus was God inside a human body. He watched how God in human form coexisted with some truly evil first century men. God incarnate didn't prove he was God by eliminating all the evil around him. He didn't overthrow the oppressive Romans, assassinate murderous Herod, or zap the power-hungry religious leaders. John watched while God in a body coexisted with evil people. He saw that a good God and bad people do coexist. But it's nothing like you would imagine. God came. He didn't eliminate all evil. He loved evil 
imperfect people. Then he went to work dealing with the evil that's inside us. God didn't eliminate imperfect evil me. He loved me. And then he went to work eliminating, working on the bad stuff that's in me. Still a work in progress. John tells us that Jesus has been doing miraculous healings, not just random acts of kindness, but signs that point to something. But the religious leaders were jealous. They didn't like that at all. They were threatened by his success, and they demanded more evidence. Well, they're about to get it. Jesus is going to perform another sign. He's actually manufacturing the situation so that no one could doubt that he is who he claims to be. He forced the hand of his opposition. Check out the story in chapter 11. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus was about one day's walk away from these close friends. And there's a subtext here. It's bad. Your mate's dying. We know you can heal. We've seen you do it before. Do something. Well, Jesus could have hurried to Lazarus' bedside. He could even have healed him from afar with a prayer. John has seen him do that before. But when he heard this message, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. In fact, though, we'll see that Lazarus died even before the message got delivered. So Jesus continued, no, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Well, we're scratching our heads here. How can sickness be for God's glory? glory. Surely it'd be better if following Jesus meant you never got sick. I'd sign up for that. But Jesus believed that bad things could happen to good people. But somehow it doesn't disprove God. It underscores God's existence because we can see his character. We can see him at work when things are difficult. It doesn't mean he's not there. But it gets more interesting. This sickness, this bad thing, part of our evil world, was allowed to run its course on purpose because Jesus had a purpose in it. Now that feels a bit uncomfortable. Jesus has a purpose in illness, in suffering. Well, John knew we'd have questions about that. He knew we'd wonder if this illness was a form of judgment on Lazarus or if Jesus had something against him. So he reminds us, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus loves these people. John tells us that because it doesn't look like it. One of them is dying. And sometimes in your life, in my life, it doesn't look like that either. But it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. Jesus manufactured this sign with a purpose in mind. It's not just for the people around him. It's for you and for me. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And that was astounding to everyone there. The disciples couldn't believe it. He'd rushed to heal complete strangers in the past. Why not go now to help his friend? Jesus is doing nothing while his close friend is sick. Have you ever felt like that? You're in trouble and you pray, but God seems to be doing nothing. You're not alone. In this case, Jesus is working up to a sign with a purpose in mind. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. At last, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Well, the disciples were scared of going closer to Jerusalem. The last time Jesus nearly got stoned to death when he was there, and so they're trying to delay Jesus. They started giving him medical advice. Sleep is good, don't wake him up. 
Have you ever tried to give God medical advice when you're praying? I know I have. Well, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Well, that's confusing. He said it wouldn't end in death. So the disciples must have wondered what on earth Jesus is doing. He's let his friends down badly is the bottom line. But what comes next is so sad for Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It's tra tragic for them. But it's wonderful for us and for future generations to hear this story. Jesus says, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there. For our sake. Jesus was glad he wasn't there to keep his friend Lazarus from the agony of dying. His sisters had to watch him die for your sake, for the sake of every parent who's buried a child, for the sake of everyone who's buried a spouse, a partner, a parent too early, for the sake of everyone who's lost a friend. Jesus manufactured a sign for everyone who's struggling to reconcile this idea of a good God and an evil world. This is a sign unfolding. So that you may believe. This sign will be so amazing. Their belief, their faith will grow strong. But let us go to him. At last, Jesus is going. Then there's a funny moment. Then Thomas, he said to the rest of the disciples, well, let's also go, that we may die with him. It's this black humor. Lazarus is dead. Jesus will probably get lynched. Maybe us too. But I thought Thomas is at least willing to go with his friend into a situation that will be uncomfortable and maybe dangerous. Meanwhile, back in Bethany, the family, the mourners, were still waiting for Jesus, but they felt let down. Jesus hadn't returned promptly to heal his close friend. In fact, he hadn't shown up at all. Lazarus' body had been laid out, anointed, and placed in the tomb. Jesus missed basically the whole funeral. He's too late. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Well, the disciples were embarrassed to turn up so late. They can't do anything now. How could Jesus have let this happen? When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. And she said, what you and I might have said. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And this is so honest, isn't it? You've probably said this in a prayer. Where were you, Jesus? If you've ever said something like this to God, it's okay. It's okay to express exactly what you feel in moments like this. God, this feels like it's partially your fault. You didn't do anything. I said that when my younger sister died of brain cancer. God, you could have intervened, but you didn't. There's nothing wrong with your faith when something doesn't go your way. Bad things happen to Jesus' friends, to good people. Martha was upset, but she was holding on, clinging to shreds of her faith. Even though you're so late, you should have been here, you could have stopped this from happening. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She hasn't given up on Jesus completely, even though he didn't answer her prayer. She still believed that he was sent from God. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, Martha assumed Jesus was in preacher mode, trying to make her feel better. And right now, she doesn't care much about theology. But Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last days. Then there was a remarkable moment. Jesus wasn't trying to give her a sermon or correct her theology. That's not generally the best thing to do when someone is in the middle of a crisis, although we do try it. He said, I am 
the resurrection and the life. So this is not the vague afterlife that Martha learned about at synagogue. This was something completely new. Martha was standing in front of the resurrection and the life personified. Jesus is the living embodiment of everything you hope for. He brings hope into even hopeless situations. What you think about Jesus is the most important thought you will ever have. Jesus continued, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Whoever of any generation, in any time, any place, whoever places their trust in Jesus will live, even though they die, will never die. Eternal life. We can't take it in. You'll die, but you won't, because death is simply a door, a transition to something eternal. Jesus saw her pain and her confusion. <clears throat> he saw where theology meets the real world. And he said, do you believe this? What a question to ask at this moment. She just watched her brother die. And death is ugly. She didn't understand it all. But she mustered up a little faith. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And we say the same, I don't get it all. I don't get why you were late, why you didn't answer my prayer. I had such hope. But I still know who you are, the one promised centuries ago, the one we've been waiting for, the anointed one, the Son of God. That's all I know in this moment. Well, Martha went home, and then her sister had a similar conversation with Jesus. She too said, you're late. You could have saved him, but you didn't. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who'd come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He shared their grief. It was a moment of tenderness. He experienced the pain of human loss himself. It was a moment of divine empathy. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus arrived outside the tomb, and he stopped there. He paused. He's too late for his friend's funeral. But Jesus entered the emotion, the pain, the fear, and the tears of that moment. Jesus wept. He didn't rush to the resolution. Though he knew what was going to happen, he stopped and he grieved for his beloved friend. He cared for Mary and Martha and the grieving community. And he weeps with us today. He understands your human tears, your loss, your fears, your frustrations. And he cares for you and for me, for our pain. He stands with us when evil seems to win. He weeps with you and with me. Then the Jews who'd come to mourn said, see how he loved him. Jesus' emotions were on public display. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Can you hear their frustration that Jesus didn't do something to stop this pain? Jesus didn't do something, so they assumed he couldn't. But the reality is, he could have, but he didn't, for your sake and mine. In this moment, Jesus chose instead to take all of our human experience and condense it into a single afternoon. We've got the pain of living and loss, the disappointment, the fear, the anger, unanswered prayer, faith anyway, the tears of God, and then finally the resolution. 
It sums up our life experience as we wrestle with the goodness of God and the pain of this world. Jesus tackled all of this here on this afternoon so that we future generations can live with hope. Well, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. Then he shocked everybody. Take away the stone, he said. Silence. It's an outrageous request, a bit insensitive to the grieving family and disrespectful to the dead. But, but Lord, said Martha, you're too late. By this time, there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Where were you? It's going to smell. Then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? What could they say? A cemetery doesn't feel very glorious. But they did what he asked. So they took away the stone, and everyone probably took a step back. Then Jesus looked up. And he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. An out loud prayer. So the people there and future generations would know just how connected Jesus and his Father are. They're, part of, the, they're of the same mind and the same purpose. And this is a crucial question for us to wrestle with. Who is this man, Jesus? If he is who he claimed to be, then all our questions are reconciled in him. He is the answer. Well, when he'd said this, when he'd prayed, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. They couldn't believe their eyes because out of the darkness, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. The corpse walked. Lazarus, a corpse no more. Still wrapped up, though, no one moved. They were paralyzed, stunned. Jesus told them to take off the grave clothes and let him go. They freed Lazarus from the wrappings of death. It's incredible. But it happened. And we're not surprised that many of the Jews who'd come to comfort the sisters and had seen this extraordinary event put their faith in Jesus. In fact, there was an explosion of followers at the end of Jesus' life because of what they saw with their own eyes. Numerous people saw Lazarus' body placed in the tomb. They knew it wasn't a trick. Then they got to talk to Lazarus himself about it. What a conversation that must have been. He was walking, living evidence of Jesus' power over death. Well, what happened next? Not surprisingly, this event caused a crisis in Jerusalem, an indisputable raising of a dead body, not far away, witnessed by many credible people. You just couldn't keep that quiet. I'd love there to have been Instagram at that time. Can you imagine the videos that would have been passed around? So Jesus' enemies, the religious leaders, plotted to have both Jesus and Lazarus executed. They couldn't have living proof walking around. Jesus has deliberately started the countdown to the cross. Lazarus' resurrection is pivotal in this plot to kill Jesus. He waited before he responded to the cry for help. He manufactured this situation on purpose because he's in control of his destiny. The cross will soon cut Jesus' life short, but it's not a glitch. It's the plan all along. Why doesn't God do something about evil? We asked this question at the beginning. He has done God came to dwell in a human body alongside imperfect men and women. He didn't eliminate evil when he came. He placed it on his son's shoulders. Jesus would take that burden on the cross so that we wouldn't perish, so we would have hope. God loves evil, imperfect people. 
He lived as one of us, and he experienced the human pain of living in our broken world. Then he went to work dealing with the evil in men and women. He broke the power that evil has over us, the power that death holds over us. In fact, he smashed it. Lazarus was a kind of demo. His resurrected body aged as normal and died again in the course of time. But Jesus' body would be resurrected into a whole new dimension. At the cross, God dealt a fatal blow to evil. Why doesn't God do something about evil? He is. God is at work right now in our broken world, often behind the scenes, often through his followers. You and I are part of what God is doing today to combat evil on a personal level, dealing with what's inside us, in our communities, making a difference in our workplaces and around the world, not only with our prayers, with our financial support and our actions. We can be part of the answer to our own heartfelt cry, God, do something. Through you and through me, God is combating evil. Why doesn't God do something about evil? He will. The next time Jesus comes to earth, he's promised to eliminate evil once and for all. He set that in motion at the cross and resurrection. Evil's days are numbered. John recorded for us a vision that God gave him of the future. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. What a promise, what God will do. So where does this leave you and me? Because we're living in this imperfect, broken world for now, trusting that God is at work for good in us and through us, praying about the evil, the sickness, the pain around us. But like Lazarus, our prayers aren't always answered in the way that we want. Jesus came through for Lazarus and answered his sister's prayers, but in a different way from what they imagined. Lazarus had to go through that pain of dying. His sisters experienced the deep grief before the miracle that was part of God's big plan. And often Jesus doesn't answer our prayers as we would like him to either. Perhaps that's because many of our prayers are for a comfortable, easy life, free from struggle and pain. But that's not God's priority. His priority is for us to have an eternity that is free from sickness, free from the shadow of death, and free from pain. And his plan is building up to that. So for now, suffering is part of our human experience. But it's important to remember that the presence of difficulty doesn't equate to the absence of God. Just because life's hard, just because evil seems to be winning, it doesn't mean God isn't here. So if this is your big question, if this makes you question the existence of God, are you willing to consider a God who's prepared to coexist with evil people as part of his plan to destroy evil for good and all because he loves us? The presence of evil doesn't equate to the absence of God. We have to remember that God's job is not to make my life safe and comfortable. He doesn't exist to serve me. But he does meet you and I in the midst of our pain. He weeps with us. And he's at work in those tough situations to bring good things out of it, to bring everything to fulfillment. So the question for us is, do I trust God even when I can't see him? Even when it feels like evil is winning, <clears throat> will I trust that he's present and doing something good in it? A friend recently underwent a major op 
and things didn't go smoothly as we'd prayed. In fact, it all went a bit pear-shaped. When she finally woke up, she struggled to communicate. Walking was impossible. I tried to encourage her to trust God in what felt like a dark place from a lonely London hospital ward. Not knowing if she'd recover, she managed to text, I do trust in him for everything. Faith, even when God hadn't answered her prayer as she wanted. She is recovering now, but slowly. But God stood with her in the darkness. And then when we see others in a situation where evil seems to be winning, we can stand with them. We can come alongside people in their struggle, like Jesus who grieved and wept with his friends. Even like Thomas, who was willing to go with Jesus into that tough situation. Am I willing to stand with others in their pain? It's not easy to be with people who are struggling. I find it hard to know what to say and I'm afraid of getting it wrong. So sorry if I wasn't there for you. But sometimes just being with someone, sharing their grief is enough. Other times there's something we can do to help bring hope and healing into their situation. They may appreciate your prayer, maybe even an out loud one. They probably don't need a sermon. They do need to know that you care, that they're not alone. If we were all willing to do this, to be there for each other when life goes wrong, then no one needs suffer alone. Through each other, our community could experience God's comforting presence in the midst of our sorrow. Helping one another, trusting God in the midst of this broken, evil world brings peace and hope into the darkness. Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you are doing something in our broken world today. Thank you that you have a plan to overcome evil. We trust you now, even in those situations where evil seems to be winning, even when we can't see what you're doing. We believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and we place our trust in him for eternity. Amen.